Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for coming today evening. And I will speak on the topic of see is seeing believing or when seeing is believing and when it isn't. So I will speak based on the Bhagavad Gita, 15th chapter, 10th and 11th verses, hmm. which talk about this theme. Krishna says, Utkramantam sthitam vapi bhunjanam vagunanvitam so he says that how the soul exists in the body, how the soul leaves the body and goes to another body, how the soul is controlled while being in a body, all this cannot be seen except with the eyes of knowledge. Pashanti jnana chakshushaha. So the eyes of knowledge, not just the eyes with which we see, the flesh eyes, but the eyes of knowledge. So I'll speak this in three broad parts. And after each part, if you have any reflections, any thoughts you would like to share or any questions like you'd like to ask, you can ask. And of course, at the end, we will have some questions. The three points I'll speak is that we don't just believe what we see, but we also see what we believe. <laughs> We don't just see what we believe, believe what we see, but we also see what we believe. And second point is that what we see or what we perceive and what we believe determines what we pursue, what we aspire for, what we look for in life. And lastly, spirituality gives us a richer way to both see and to believe. Thereby changing what we pursue in our life. So seeing is believing. So let's go start with the first point. That first point is that we don't just believe what we see, but we also see what we believe. So seeing is believing is often a common argument that people use to say that who has seen God? Who has seen the soul? Why should we believe in such things? Now, at one level, seeing is believing is is a important principle for functioning in the world if we consider animals who live, live in jungles if they see a danger say if a deer is grazing and it sees some big shadow or some sudden movement immediately says there's danger and oh there's danger i have to run so it sees and the capacity to see and to there how I act. That is very important. Now, actually speaking, animals for their survival rely much more on smell than sight. In fact, humans are among the species who rely far more on sight than on smell or other senses. Animals rely a lot on smell. That's why if a tiger wants to attack a deer, the wind is moving this way. The tiger will go all the way around so that its smell will not go to the deer. And then it will attack from the other side. Now the point is that seeing is believing is a vital principle for survival. Because we see some danger, then we can protect ourselves from it. At the same time, what do we see actually? Say, let's consider a small child. Maybe a one, two year old small child and the child is at home maybe just crawling along learning to walk and suddenly from a corner in the ground maybe some small hole in the wall a mouse appears over there. Now this child has never seen a mouse till now. Now when the child sees the mouse it doesn't know what it is and the child turns and then maybe if the mother is in the room, the child looks at the mother. This is better. The child looks at the mother and then he, he looks at the expression on the face of the mother. Because for the child, when the child sees the mouse, it doesn't know what the mouse is. Now, if the mother just smiles, it's okay, no danger. Hmm? The mouse is there, it will go away. If the mother immediately comes to the child and says, oh, sorry. Then the child says, okay, I have to be careful. Now imagine if the mother has a phobia for mice. And the mother immediately jumps on the bed 
and it starts screaming. Then, for the rest of the life, that baby might have enormous fear of mice. Because the child doesn't understand simply by seeing. For it to make sense of what it is seeing, it needs to look at someone else. And the, the mother's facial expression says fear, horror, terror. Then the child equates the mouse with the source of fear, horror, terror. And the child, starts, child will also start imitating the mother, jumping, crying and becoming paranoid. So now what applies so graphically in the case of a child apply, uh, 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 applies actually to us for throughout our life. So whenever we see a thing, the data entering into our eyes itself doesn't mean much. What that data means depends on how we perceive that data. By perceive, I mean how we understand it, how we comprehend it. So, if a, my, a mouse is believed to be a danger, the child will see a mouse and become filled with fear. But if a mouse is believed to be a harmless creature, just a small thing going here and there, then the child will see the mouse but will not be affected by it. Okay, let it go. So we don't just believe what we see, but we also see what we believe. So if we believe that a mouse is a danger, we see it to be a danger. If, and the same principle applies to various aspects of our life. So for example, now some people may say that, okay, if there is a really a soul, if I would see it, I would believe it. If there is a God, if I would see God, I would believe him. Okay, that can sound like a reasonable argument. But even if we saw God, what sense would we make of that? We need some frame of reference. We need some intellectual conception before we can make sense of our perception. Now, the whole idea that seeing is believing it has been left far behind by science. I mean, those people who often reject spirituality, they also claim to be scientific. But science does not operate on seeing as believing. In fact, almost all scientific progress requires us that not that we see and we believe, but rather we see then we theorize. And whenever we theorize, what are we doing? A few years ago, I was invited to speak on in Cambridge University on science and spirituality. So while we were going to Cambridge, we passed by the same tree under which Newton is said to have seen the fruit falling. Some people say it was, what fruit was it? Apple. apple, yeah. Some people say the apple fell in front of him. Some people say it fell on him, on his head. Either way, wherever it fell, now when the apple fell, actually, how many times since the beginning of time have apples fallen down? <laughs> how many times? Countless, Countless. unlimited millions of times. Now, what happened special at this particular time? It was whatever special happened was not because of seeing his believing. He saw, then he thought about what he saw. What made this apple fall? And based on that, he came up with the principle that one object is attracted to another object. And that is the principle of gravitational force. Now, interestingly, can anyone see gravity? We can see the effect of gravity, but we can't see gravity. 
So, in fact, all knowledge grows when we take visible observations and place them within invisible principles. So, the principle of gravity is invisible. So, just what we see doesn't help us to make sense much. It is when we see something which is visible and from that we make some conceptual category that is invisible. That is how knowledge grows. So, this is not rejecting what we are seeing, but we don't restrict ourselves to what we see. If we start restricting ourselves to what we see, then no conceptual categorization is possible. So, so see, this, is, this is the action of gravity. Scientific knowledge advances when we look for principles which are invisible, but they make sense of what is visible. So, within science, there are these two schools or uh, two, you could say, ways of knowing. One is called empiricism and the other is rationalism. Empiricism is, doesn't even know what is empiricism. It's empirical, what we perceive with our senses. So, in empiricism, the thrust is on observations. Whereas, rationalism is reasoning, is theorizing. So, in rationalism, the focus is on uh, theories that we make to explain what we see. Now, both of them, of course, come together, what we see and what we reason. Now, originally when science started, the focus was on empiricism. So, Francis Bacon and other pioneers of science were empiricists. But as science evolved, it went deeper and deeper into theories. And Einstein famously said that if a theory is beautiful, whether it is, but the beauty of a theory is more important than its verification through observations. Now, what this means is, if we consider the whole field of quantum physics, in quantum physics, there are so many complicated phenomena that exist, none of them can be perceived. Not just because they are so small, but because they are conceptual. And yet, quantum physics powers most of the technology that we see in the world today. So, as a famous quantum physicist, he said that if you think you have understood quantum physics, that means you have not understood it. <laughs> <laughs> so, another quantum physicist said that quantum physics is not only more diff is not only more strange than what we believe. No, it is not only stranger than what we imagine. It is stranger than what we can imagine. What we can even imagine. So, in quantum physics, the theory works. But if you try to correlate with the observations or even try to come up with a mental model of it, a, vi a visual, visual image in the mind, there's just no image. Everything, so right now, you are sitting on solid ground, I am sitting on this chair. But according to quantum physics, there is no such thing as solid particle. There are only waves. Now, how the waves come together to give us the solid objects that we perceive, that's a mystery in science. A famous uh, quantum physicist has said that when he was asked, uh, how do we make sense of the quantum physics model of the world? So, he, he, this is guide, a famous quantum physicist said, stop, stop thinking, start calculating. So, the mathematics was great. But you try to come up with a visual model, it's very difficult, almost impossible. So here again, the point I'm drawing is that, not that science rejects the visible world, but the beyond the visible world is an invisible world. And that invisible is far more powerful and influential than the visible. So the invisible world is what can lead to destruction like in atom bombs or it can lead to the kind of connection that we have today just by pressing a few buttons we can call anyone we can message anyone in any part of the world now where is the internet you might say there are cables which connect but now we have wi-fi so where is the internet it's not visible but its effects are visible 
So the point is that even science often comes up with theories and the theories shape the perceptions. So we don't just believe what we see, but we also see what we believe. So what I, what I mean by see what we believe is that, so if we are told, okay, there's Wi-Fi connectivity over here. Now we don't see Wi-Fi anywhere, do we? We see Wi-Fi as bars on our phone. But that's not really seeing a representation of that. But we believe there's Wi-Fi and we connect and it works. So seeing is only one small way of knowing. And broadly speaking, empirical perception. So perceiving with our senses is only one small way of knowing. And in fact, our progress in knowledge, in any knowledge, happens primarily by not just restricting ourselves to what we see, but by conceptualizing to make sense of what we see. And this principle which applies in science, which applies in various branches of knowledge, also applies in spirituality. So if somebody doesn't believe that there is anything called spiritual, then no matter what what observations can be made, what reasoning can be provided, they will not accept it. So seeing is believing would lead to the rejection of quantum physics, would reject, lead to the rejection of most of the technology in the world today. So nobody lives according to seeing is believing. We believe and that shapes our seeing. So there is a dynamic interaction between the struct, physical structures of the world and the mental structure that help us to make sense of the world. So the physical structures shape the mental structures and the mental structures shape the physical structures. So and we exist as a conscious being who receive the information that comes from the interaction of the physical structures in the outer world and the mental structures within us. So that was the first point that we don't just see what we believe, believe what we see, but we also see what we believe. Any comments or questions about this? Yes. There's actually so many other things that exist in the sky because we love so many things that exist every day. Yes, excellent point. Justice, value, love, equality. We can't see them. Now I was in MIT in America, Massachusetts, giving a talk, and somebody was asking there, now, can you prove that God exists? So, can you empirically prove? Can you prove that God exists? So, I asked him. So, can you prove that your mother loves you? Of course, my mother loves me. How can you prove it? Can you, how will you empirically prove your mother loves you? Say, oh, my mother is, smiles when I come, when I come in front of her. But you're somebody who is planning to swindle, you may also smile brightly. When you, when you come in front of them, isn't it? <laughs> Oh, my mother always takes care of me whenever I am sick. A hospital nurse may also do that. The hospital nurse doesn't love, love you. Now, all the actions that we may equate with love, others may also do that for us. Oh, my mother cooks food, for, cooks rice food for me. Well, you go to a hotel, they will also cook food for you. And they will give you. So now, just by empirical way, we can't really arrive at a conclusion of value. Love is a value. So, so what is the, the world of facts cannot really necessarily lead to the world of values. The world of facts is there, but from there we could draw different values. It doesn't lead, there's no one necessary pathway. So, there are different ways of knowing different things. It's not just the one way. So if we want to know higher realities, it's like a chain of inferences that we draw. If it's a nowadays, a mathematics is the way of knowing. So can we have, scientific people say, the mathematics is the way of knowing. So can you have a loveometer, like a thermometer, barometer, and put it on the mother's heart and see when, what is the reading over there? We don't get any reading. So basically, <coughs> our values are also, we know that they exist. But we draw them as inferences from a wide chain of events or wide, wide incidents. So similarly, we can draw inferences about spirituality also. Thank you. Any other points? Yeah. Um, you mentioned this is 
see the effect of something that you import and play that seems to be the best that you can describe it. Now, with people with limited knowledge, they can see the effect of earthquakes and everything, and then with their limited knowledge, say, look, but this is what God is, therefore I don't have to believe because you're saying um, God protects us and whatnot, but the effects that I see of God is destructive. So why is there a destructive God? And they come to that conclusion. Okay, good question. So if somebody says that that actually God is destructive because we see earthquakes, uh, killing innocent people, so then where is God? You say God protects. So basically, this is a broad, this is a specific instance of the broader question that, of the problem of evil. You know, why do bad things happen to good people if there is a God? So let's turn this question around and ask if, if we presume that there is no God, that there is atheism in the world, then why should bad things not happen to good people? What do you mean, why should this should not happen? Good things should happen to good people, bad things to bad people. Why? If everything is governed by impersonal laws which have no plan behind them, if everything is a product of just mechanical laws and fundamental particles colliding, then anything can happen to anyone. So the very question that why do bad things happen to good people implies a presumption. We presume that good things should happen to good people and bad things should have to happen to bad people. Now, and within the atheistic worldview or the godless worldview, there is absolutely no basis for this presumption. Absolutely no basis. So the argument that why are bad things happening to good people, that has a presumption for which atheism has no justification. But even the most hardcore atheist, do they actually believe that everything happens by chance? That everything happens by just impersonal laws. We are just nothing but fundamental particles moving around endlessly and aimlessly. Even an atheist, will they train their children while they are growing up, teach their children? No, everything in the world happens by chance. You know, whether you clean your room or not, whether the room will stay clean or not, it's by chance. You know, whether you brush your teeth or not, your teeth will get rotten or they will not get rotten. And nothing happens. Not, nothing. There is no cause-effect connection. No. Even atheists, so actually in a sense, even the most hardcore atheist doesn't actually live atheistically. In the sense that presuming that everything happens by, happens purposelessly, happens without any cause of a connection, we, nobody lives like that. So we could turn that question around and say that, why should bad things not happen to good people? That itself doesn't have any explanation. Now, mm, if we say, turning the question back again, okay, the God exists, and therefore there is some kind of causal connection. So, so the very fact that we presume that good things should lead to good good results, good actions should lead to good results and bad actions to bad results. That presumption is also based on some observation. We see normally, if we eat healthy food, we stay healthy. If we study well, we do well in our exams. Now, of course, there are exceptions. But the exceptions stand out because they are exceptions. If they were the norm, then they would not stand out at all. So, so now, rather than dismissing, uh, rather than dismissing the existence of God, we can try to see: can we make sense of these exceptions? See, within the atheistic worldview, all that you have is, okay, you know, why earthquakes happen? We don't know. It's just by chance. But uh, if you keep a cup at the edge of your table, it will fall. That is not by chance. So, what do we have in the atheistic worldview? We have like small islands of meaning in a vast ocean of meaninglessness. <laughs> you know, why did this happen? This happens because of this. Why did this happen? This happens because of this. But why do we exist? No purpose. Why do, okay, if a stone, if a stone falls on my foot, okay, I'll let go of it. But if a meteorite falls on my head, I just don't know why it happens. So, basically, it's 
if there is an island of meaning, if there is an island that makes sense, then the, maybe the ocean also makes sense. So, the, you know, the theistic worldview explains that actually we need to expand our frame of reference to make sense of things. What does that mean, expand our frame of reference? Even in science, gravity was the bedrock of Newtonian physics, which is called as classical physics, till the start of the 20th, of the start of the 20th century. In fact, Lord Kelvin, after whom we had the temperature scale, uh, who is a prominent physicist, he had said in, towards the end of the 20th, 19th century that the biggest problem for physicists in the future century will be unemployment. We have understood all of nature now. For future generations, they just have to fill in the fill in the details. That's all. But by the start of the 20th century, two, two big upheavals occurred. The fundamental particles, to try to make sense of them, we had to come up with quantum physics. For cosmic bodies, we had to come up with relativity. And why did we have to come up with that? Because Newtonian physics couldn't explain these things. Now, the way fundamental particles move within an atom, Newton's laws of gravity couldn't make sense of that. And similarly, objects which move very fast in outer space, they didn't seem to be constrained always by the laws of physics, as, as postulated by Newton. So then when the Newtonian laws of physics didn't work, scientists didn't say that, okay, everything happens by chance. So, okay, this theory doesn't work, there must be some deeper theory. So now, relativity is seen as a superset. And Newtonian, and Newtonian physics is seen as a subset within that. This is, now these are all very complicated technical subjects. I'm just giving a bare bones outline of this. But the point which I'm making is that when cause-effect correlation doesn't make sense, we don't reject cause-effect correlation in science. Rather, we try to expand the frame of reference so that the cause-effect correlation can make sense. And that expanding the frame of reference is what is done by spirituality. This was actually going to be my second point also. So your question leads nicely to that. So the expanded frame of reference is that spiritual wisdom, such as the Bhagavad Gita tells us, we are spiritual beings. And the soul is eternal. So the soul exists before this birth, before our birth, and the soul exists after death. And the cause-effect connection between action and results extends beyond this birth also. So sometimes the results which we get are of actions which are done immediately. Say, if somebody uh, puts their hand in fire or near fire, they get burnt. The, re the result is immediate. If, say, on a cold night like this, somebody eats 10 ice creams, mm -hmm. the result may come after 5 6 hours. Ice cream! <laughs> we start screaming in pain at that time, you know. So, if somebody keeps eating uh, lots of deserts, maybe after 10 years they might get diabetes. So somebody starts smoking at the age of 17, maybe at the age of 47 they get lung cancer, 30 years later. So we see that causes don't lead to effects immediately. So this idea that cause effect, there can be a time lag between them, this spirituality extends this frame of reference to before this life and beyond this life. So when sometimes bad things happen to good people, it simply means that some negative action which they have done in the past is coming, is, is happening now. Now we may say this is just a speculation. Yeah, it is, we could say from our perspective. But it is an inference that is in harmony with our experience in a limited frame. So even people who say, oh, why did this terrible thing happen to me? Is it that after some terrible thing happens, they stop believe, disbelieving in cause effect entirely? Say, suppose somebody, suppose somebody suddenly gets cancer. Now, cancer is a disease, often its cause is very difficult to know. But what do people do after that? If they get cancer, immediately they go to a doctor and ask, what is the treatment? Now, when they are asking for a treatment, that means they are immediately believing in cause effect connection. Isn't it? Okay, that means if I take this treatment, this cause will remove the cancer from my body. So nobody in principle rejects the cause of a connection just because some effects don't seem to have cause within our frame of reference. So when we are not rejecting the cause of a connection 
and when the cause effect connection has no basis within a materialistic world view then it is reasonable to infer that the cause effect connection will require a bigger frame of reference to make sense does that answer your question okay. any other questions okay we'll come back to you if you don't mind so let this lead to the next point so i was going to talk about <clears throat> the second point is about when i said that we don't just see what we be believe what we see but also see what we believe so how does this apply to our spirituality so one thing is i talked about this expanded frame of reference see life doesn't life doesn't make coherent sense within the framework of one life yes when in one lifetime it makes some sense but not coherent sense not proper sense why not proper sense because say if we consider there is a exam and the students if they pass the exam they get good marks if they don't do well in the don't write an answer properly they get bad they get get they fail now in that sense in the exam there is cause effect correlation but suppose in a classroom some students are given very easy question paper and some students are given a very difficult question paper then the question the students mind will be not answering the question on the paper <laughs> no, the question will be why the difference isn't it so now of course the students the students answer the questions over there they will get marks but still the question remains why the difference so similarly if we consider life to be an exam in this if we apply in any area of life if we apply ourselves if we take responsibility we will do better than if we are lethargic and irresponsible that's true but still we all get different question papers some of us are born poor some of us are born wealthy some of us are born uh, brilliant intelligent brilliantly intelligent some of us are born brilliantly unintelligent <laughs> you could say <laughs> um, uh, some of us have looks which make us want to parade our face in front of everyone some of us have looks which make us want to hide our face in front of everyone so why this variety so within the limited frame of reference of this life it's like why the different question papers the the most reasonable explanation could be that all the students are in the same exam but they are, are they're in the same exam room but they are parts of different courses and the exam is determined by what they have studied in the past what they need to go to the next level so similarly for us the varieties that we experience in our life right from the starting point itself and over the course of life also so those varieties will make sense only within a bigger frame of reference and that bigger frame of reference will make sense, will be feasible or will be reasonable only when we posit something that exists before death before birth or beyond death and that the bhagavad gita says is the atma the soul so this is one line of inference to talk about the spiritual another line of inference i'll talk about is our longing we all long to love and be loved and not just to love and be loved but to love forever and to be loved forever many of the movies many of the novels are about romance and most romance ends with happily ever after and the bhagavad gita says this world is dukkhale mashashvat it's exact opposite happily ever after dukkhale mashashvat this is stressful and it is temporary and the reality of life is that relationships are temporary relationships can often lead to distress also but still we have such a deep longing to live forever and to love forever where does this longing come from this longing is very strange if we were simply material creatures 
then all our desires would also be a result of the material world around us now in the world around us nothing lasts forever even huge mountains they also have a beginning and they will have an end i was in new york recently so there the twin towers when they fell it was not just the fall of a structure it was the the twin towers represented security and power and prosperity and they fell the bubble of comfort and safety that was created that was shattered so, so the point is we have abundant reminders of our mortality in the world around us and there is nothing that is immortal then why do we have a longing to live forever so imagine there is some remote australian tribe living disconnected from the world no mobile no internet and one day suddenly a child goes to his mother and says in that tribe mom mom i want a pizza now what would the mother say what do you think yeah what when do you think the mother would say when did you hear about this pizza yeah when did you hear about a pizza nobody in their community knows they're presuming the mother knows or the mother but we also not know otherwise <laughs> what is the pizza the mother we also ask but somehow we assume the mother knows so the question where did you come to know about a pizza pizza isn't it so the point here is our longing for immortality in a world where there is only mortality is as out of place as a tribal child's longing for a pizza in a setting where there is no knowledge of pizza now suppose say after this program you are going along you are about to leave and you see a golden ring fallen over here now assuming you don't take it away <laughs> <laughs> now you may actually get the question where did this come from you know this ball is not gold this floor is not gold so something is out of place it immediately raises the question where did it come from so our longing for lasting life is out of place in this in the world of matter which by its very intrinsic definition is temporary so therefore where does this longing come from again a reasonable inference could be that it comes from something non material that non material the bhagavad gita explains is the soul the soul is sat chit anand it is eternal it is conscious and it is pleasure seeking and that is why we see those tendencies within us also now if i if i cut this chair the chair will not try to clot and heal itself to it deteriorate it deteriorates it doesn't tend to preserve its existence but if our skin is cut we tend to, our body tends to heal so we want to perpetuate our existence so why is that because the souls longing for souls innate nature to live forever is being projected onto the body and the soul is eternal and we are seeking eternity at the physical level of course at the physical level eternity is not possible but the our very longing for eternity points to our spirituality so in this way even if we can't see the soul based on what we can see we can infer the existence of the soul and taking this point further we, know, we don't just long to live forever we also long to love forever and we want to love we love forever means the object of love should also live forever i have written a book on reincarnation and a student a young boy once asked me a question said that uh, i i am in love with a girl but somehow our parents are not agreeing and our marriage is not working out so i want can you tell me what karma can i do by which i can marry her in my next life <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so the idea is that actually we want to project our loving relationships beyond this world so why is that we want to love forever that means when you want an object of love that will also last forever and we don't, we don't just want to love anyone and everyone we want somebody to be worthy, to be truly worthy of our love now, our biases come out very strongly when uh, we want to choose our partners so you want somebody who is att as attractive as wealthy as having the desirable qualities that we want to see in someone so the so the bhagavad gita and the bhakti yoga tradition explains that our longing mm. for love points to an eternal all attractive object of love very fact that we long to love forever mean that there has to be an object who lives forever and who can love us forever whom we can love forever and that object is the infinite is the ultimate reality that object is god god is known by different names in different traditions the <clears throat> bhagavad gita knows him by the name krishna and again this is a inference but as i said it's a reasonable inference we can draw so what we pursue depends on what we can perceive and what we believe so if we only see the material and believe only the material we will pursue only the material we will chase after only the material and what will be the result of that the result is well known life is like a race and we are all trying to run as fast as possible ahead in the race and now whether you come first or last in the race at the end everybody gets the same reward everybody is shot dead <laughs> when you come to the finishing line tak shot dead. so we are all trying to get ahead in life but unfortunately what is there ahead ultimately there is death so so in the material conception our existence is nothing except just a little bit of racing around trying to gain something enjoyable till death does us in sometimes if you are watching a movie now if some part of the movie is not interesting you do fast forward isn't it just fast forward and then and some something interesting seems to be happening then we slow it down and watch it again so now if we did a fast forward of a average human life what would we see now a person a baby is lying flat on the ground the baby starts flapping around moving hands and legs and then they just get grows and starts running around and runs around runs around runs around, grows bigger and bigger keeps running around faster and faster and then starts running slower and slower and then falls and it falls permanently so that that would be a fast forward accelerated movie reel of a, of a average life so isn't there anything more to life we all think of our life as meaningful but death is the ultimate challenge to the meaningfulness of life so at least it's reasonable to consider might there be a part of us that lives beyond death So, that, so again, materialism reduces our life to meaninglessness. Spirituality opens our life to the possibility of enduring meaning. So, the Bhagavad Gita explains that we are souls, and what is the enduring meaning for life? The soul is on a multi-life journey of spiritual evolution, and spiritual evolution means evolution in our consciousness. evolution in our capacity to understand life's realities evolution in our capacity to love to to love the eternal and to be loved by the eternal that is the culmination of this evolution so when the baby is small the baby loves only one thing you know the baby cries and the mother gives milk to the baby now initially the baby doesn't even know that the, the there's a person who's existing for the mother for the baby the only love is the breast that is feeding the baby 
afterward the baby starts understanding the, the object of love grows oh this is not just the breast actually there's a person over here the person loves me and as she grows as the baby grows further and okay there's not just my mom there's my dad also over here and there's so many people so as we grow we grow in our we naturally grow in the objects that we love so a small child may play with toys but as we grow up then we start directing our attention our affection our interest to bigger things in life of course sometimes people don't is it it's <laughs> nowadays many kids just keep playing games and when they grow up so video games are such a obsession yeah yeah just the toys are changing but normally if we have balanced growth what happens as we grow the object of our love grows in fact if we look at the people who inspire us most in our lives almost anyone who inspires you in your life will be someone who has some big object of love people who love themselves nobody loves them <laughs> it's a if if we are inspired by say some freedom fighters for our country or some some patriots some heroic soldiers some anybody who has lived for some bigger cause than themselves that is what is ennobling that is what is inspiring say somebody is drowning and somebody jumps in and saves their lives we, we applaud that person as a hero so basically as our as we grow our capacity our, our the object that we love is meant to grow and this growth culminates when we learn to love the eternal now when we love the eternal that doesn't mean we stop loving everyone else now god is not just one being existing somewhere far away god is actually the basis of all being he includes everyone he is the whole we are the parts mama imam isho jeeva loke jeeva bhuta sanatana so when we love the divine we learn to love everyone else also connected with the divine and thus when we evolve spiritually by directing our love towards the divine we also can contribute better materially we can do our responsibilities better because we learn to love others not just for what they give us but seeing them as parts of the divine who is our ultimate object of love so our love becomes more stabler more deeper stabler and deeper and so this was the second point that when we perceive the spiritual when we begin okay, what we see and what we believe by that we infer about the spiritual then we can perceive perceive the spiritual so any questions or comments about this okay the last point is brief with which i'll conclude so the last point is that as i hinted towards it that the spiritual changes how we see and how we believe it changes doesn't doesn't mean that as i said to become spiritual doesn't mean to reject the material it means to not restrict ourselves to the material because when we become spiritual we we try to connect with the supreme spiritual reality god and he is the source of both matter and spirit so because he is the source of both matter and spirit what happens is that when we connect with him we connect with everything at a deeper level and this can help us even in our daily life in the world today how can it help us one of the biggest problems in the world today is uh, is mental health problems the mental health problems can be of various types one major mental health problem is worry fear anxiety whatever name we give to it now worry is like the tax that we pay on loans we haven't yet taken <laughs> we worry about so many things and most of those things don't happen this may go wrong that may go wrong that may go wrong that may go wrong 
and it causes us so much fear so what when we become spiritual what happens by that is that we learn to differentiate between what is in our control and what is beyond our control in the materialistic world we we think what is beyond our control is just out of control but in the spiritual world we we understand that what is beyond our control is under some higher control and with that understanding you know, we can focus on what what is in our hands and we can let go of what is not in our hands so a spiritual way of living how it can transform us positively to help us say deal with fear it can help us to deal with many many things but how it can help us to deal with fear i'll conclude with a simple acronym fear it's f e a r f is focus so when we start feeling worry fear anxiety what can we do focus means what is the exact problem right now basically fear sets us fighting against an invisible enemy what do we fight against okay what if oh, you know i got some i got some swelling on my neck what if i have throat cancer yeah say <laughs> that fear starts coming to us so focus what is the exact problem right now okay the exact problem is that okay i've got this swelling on the throat okay, what is the exact problem right now is this paining me uh, no but it is just there what is the exact problem okay just this there's a little overgrowth over here so what happens you come down to specific what is the exact problem right now right now okay i don't have any pain but this is overgrowth is there and f is focus e is engage engage means what can i do about it right now okay right now uh, i can't do anything but i'll fix up an appointment with the doctor and check with the doctor so right now if i can't do anything the best thing i can do is push it, push it put it aside then or, or the right thing that i can do right now is you just call and get an appointment with the doctor so what happens is that when we are not spiritual our mind can drive us here there and everywhere but focus and engage gets us grounded in the present what can i do right now then the next two are primarily related to spirituality a is arise arise means i understand that i exist above my situations i am a spiritual being so it's like say if a flood is coming into the house where he is living and we are panicky this water is rising 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 so this happened to one of my friends who was in florida and that hurricane hurricane irma hit him so he had gone for a retreat over writing retreat over there and he was alone staying in a house and one morning he woke up and tried to turn on the power there was no power and he opened the he opened the window and looked out he didn't see any road anywhere no ground anywhere all around was water and he tried to surf on the net using a residual battery power there was no net and he saw the water was rising 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 and he didn't know what to do and then he was looking around looking around becoming fearful and as he was becoming a little more and more fearful suddenly he looked around and he saw because he had been he had just come to that house and staying there for a few days It's not his house. It is just a house that he he had got as a retreat or some arrangement for writing. So he looked and he saw there seemed to be something like a closet, but it was quite a big door. He had not noticed it really. So he went there and he pulled it open, and he saw a small fleet of stairs up. And he went up the stairs. He saw there was an attic over there, and he waited in the attic. The water rose, 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 rose. It covered the first level but he was safe in that second level and after some time the water went down so now if he had not discovered that attic he would have panicked and he might have drowned also so similarly for us you know, we exist mostly at the material level we function at the material level of reality but arise means by our spirituality we understand that we have a core that is indestructible the bhagavad gita says that nothing can hurt the soul in any way so no matter how big problems may come in our lives we as souls are indestructible so when we raise our consciousness up we gain a sense of security by that 
and R is release. Release means that we just let go of the things that are not in our control, knowing that there is a higher control. There is a higher control. What is not in my control, just let me go. Let me let go of it. When we let go of things, what happens? By letting go of the things that are not in our control, we can hold on to things that are in our control. The more we hold on to things that are not in our control, the more our mind goes out of control. What if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? So when we think like that, actually we just make ourselves more and more agitated and disempowered. So there is a bigger plan. And if you look at our lives, we all have gone through many, many dangers in the past. And we've survived. All of us are survivors. So whatever danger is coming, there is a higher plan and it will deal with that plan. And that higher plan will deal with those things. We do our part. We do, we play the part of the part and the whole will take care of the whole. Now when we understand that we are a part and there is a bigger whole of which we are a part. Say when we take a flight, in about four or five days I am going to America from here. So when I catch a flight, I will be concerned, I have my boarding pass with me, I have my passport with me. Now will I worry? Is there enough fuel in the airplane? <laughs> Will I worry? What if, the air, what if the pilot is drunk? No, I don't have to worry about that. I have to play the part of the part. And there is there's a whole system that will take care of the whole. So if you look at our own lives, dangers can come in so many different ways. But the very fact that we are alive right now means that there is more right than wrong in our lives. <laughs> you know, whatever our age, maybe 35, 40, 45, for most of us, 50. There's so many people who die before they come to our age. And is it that we have, by our meticulous planning, protected ourselves from every single danger in the 30, 35, 45 years of our life? No, there is a higher plan. So release. So when we do this, we'll find that we will be able to live a better life, a richer life, a life that is not tormented by uncontrollables, a life that is more meaningful because we see it as a part of a bigger evolution. And thus, spirituality is not just about benefits that we will get in some unknown, unseen future. The spirituality will give us benefits here and now. If we learn to grow spiritually by studying the Bhagavad Gita, by connecting with Krishna, through chanting his names, by associating with his devotees, we will find that we will get, a, get greater peace, greater clarity, greater purpose in our life even now. So, so by pursuing something beyond what we can see, we will create a better life in the world that we can see. Our life will be more peaceful, more purposeful, and ultimately more joyful. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke three main points. I spoke on the topic of when seeing is believing and when it isn't. The first point I focused was, was that we don't just believe what we see. We also see, see, what, we see what we believe. So I talked about that. A child first, a small baby is first time seeing a mouse. If the mother is fearful, the child conceives the mouse as a fear, object of fear. So what we believe shapes our perceptions. So both what we, the physical structures in the world around us and the mental structures within us, both interact dynamically to shape our experiences. And science progresses not by rejecting what we see, but by not restricting ourselves to what we see. Uh, sci science progresses by taking visible phenomena and inferring invisible principles. Like Newton on seeing the falling flaw apple inferred gravity. And in fact, as science becomes more and more intricate, it leaves empiricism behind. That means it leaves a seen world behind and goes deep into a unseen, invisible, theoretical world as is seen in quantum physics. And, ye, and one of the biggest insights from science today is that the invisible world 
affects the visible world far more than what we would normally think. So that same reasoning we could apply. Could there be some, just said there are invisible material subtle forces. Could there be something invisible spiritual also? So for that, I talked about three different lines of reasoning to infer, is there something spiritual? So what we see and what we believe will determine what we pursue in life. So the first reasoning I talked about is cause-effect connection. That we do see cause-effect connection working, but when it doesn't work, why? So why should good action lead to good results and bad action to bad results? Atheism or materialism just doesn't have any way, rational basis for any cause-effect connection at all. But we all function based on cause-effect connection. And when bad things happen to good people, we ask the question why? Because it is an exception to the norm. That's why it stands out. So why is the norm there? And the, to understand the norm, to the, understand the norm, it's reasonable to perceive some higher intelligence and higher order. To, to, to infer about some higher intelligence and higher order. And to when the exception comes up, we could say that maybe we need to expand the frame of reference. Just like when Newtonian physics didn't make sense, scientists didn't reject cause and effect connection. They thought of a bigger theory, say relativity theory, which could explain accommodated gravity. So, nobody rejects cause-effect connection just because some effect doesn't seem to have a cause. It's like if somebody gets cancer, uh, they don't, uh, they immediately look for treatment. That means they still believe in cause-effect connection. So then, when we believe, then why not consider that if a, with a, with a, within a bigger frame of reference, some effects that we are getting now might be from some cause beyond what we see. So, inferring a spiritual side, core to us, a soul, who exists before birth and exists after death, that can make help us make better sense of what we experience in life. And <clears throat> we, uh, just like a child who has, is just a group of students who have an exam, all of them, their, their grades will depend on the exam, but the papers are different. So, why is that? Because they are part of a different course, different courses. And that means that similarly, we look at a, quite a bigger frame of reference to make sense of what we see within the frame of reference that we have. The other inference I drew was from our longing to love forever and to live forever. It's as out of place in this mortal world as is a African, as, as a remote tribal child wanting to know about pizza or as we finding a gold ring over here. So the, because nothing material lasts forever. So our desire to live forever and to love forever points to a core within us that lives forever, that is the soul, and a whole who can be a worthy object of love. That is the all-attractive divine. And the third inference was that we all live life as if it is very meaningful. We make our choices responsibly. But death is the ultimate sabotage of meaning in life. So, it's reasonable to consider whether life could have a purpose beyond death. Otherwise, why should we have meaning even in this life? Why should we have islands of meaning within an ocean of meaninglessness? So the, so the bigger meaning comes when we see that life's purpose is spiritual evolution. To grow in our capacity to love. Just like infants grow from playing with toys to working on bigger things in life. And the most inspiring people in our, in our lives are those who have some big object to love, some worthy cause to love. So similarly for us, a spiritual evolution means when we learn to love the divine. And when we love the divine, that doesn't mean we, when we uh, reject the material, rather reject the what, we, what is visible, the people around us, but rather we connect them all with the divine. So spiritual doesn't mean rejecting the material, it means not restricting ourselves to the material. And I talk about how what we can't see can create a better life for us in the world that we see. And that one example I gave that for that was dealing with fear. The acronym fear was focus, engage and release. So <clears throat> if we understand that, especially A and R related spirituality, if you understand that I am indestructible, being spiritual, then we discover a higher higher level to the house in which we are living. And that can give us some peace. <coughs> and secondly, when we release, 
we understand that what is not in my control is in some higher control. And thus, we can gain better perspective for dealing with the things we have to deal with in our lives. <coughs> Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare. <coughs> Any questions or comments? Yeah, okay. So atheists do believe in cause and effect. They just don't believe that God has any role for it. Yeah. To in it. Yeah, I didn't say that atheists don't believe in cause and effect. What I said is atheism does not have any rational basis for the cause effect correlation. It's the difference. Atheists do believe in cause effect. But if everything that exists were a result of unguided natural processes, say some primordial matter exploding, then why would that prime explosion from a primordial matter by completely unguided natural processes lead to uh, the formation of a world governed by precise by specific laws of mathematical precision so the existence of uh, laws in uh, laws itself raises a question so it's not that when we talk about god some people say that oh science can't explain this this can't explain this therefore there is god that's not what we are talking about. God is not the explanation for the unexplainable. He is the explanation for explainability. The explanation for explainability means why is the universe explainable? Why does cause effect correlation exist at all? So there's a famous Nobel laureate mathematician Eugene Wigner. He wrote a paper. The the illogical effectiveness of mathematics in the natural science. So he said the, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in natural sciences. So he says that many of the mathematical concepts, say for example, square root of minus one or whatever, they are constructs of our mind. Now why should constructs of our mind uh, correlate with behaviors of objects in the outer world? So this is the effectiveness of mathematics and natural sciences is a gift that we neither understand nor deserve. It's just a gift. So India's Srinivas Ramanujan, famous mathematician, he said that an equation for me makes no sense unless it represents a thought of God. So why does the cause effect correlation exist? Now, now atheists could say that's all that exists, but why does it exist? So nobody knows any answer for that. Maybe it exists. But normally, whenever we see a cause of a correlation, there has to be some system governing that. Some, some system, some intelligence, some, some, something overriding governing that. So it's a reasonable inference to say that the cause of a correlation uh, exists and that an explanation for it is required. Now what, um, when atheists say God is not there, what is reasonable to say is that God doesn't constantly intervene in the world. So yes, see, the, the Ishopanishad says that this world is made complete. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate. So the absolute truth is complete and what emanates from the absolute is also complete. So that means if this world is complete, that means it does, for every small thing in this world, God's constant personal intervention is not required. 
God exi- God has created the system of law, system of cause effect. It's created rules, and those rules are basically what function in the world. So we don't see God as a as an alternative to the law cause effect in the world, nor as an intervener, but rather we see that God is the foundation for the cause effect correlation. Any other questions? Yeah. Everybody is doing the same sadhana and everything, but there is a difference in the way they perceive spirituality. Um, in terms of the, the faith, how much faith they have in spirituality. Is it because of the way they see spirituality in relation to uh, how it how it impacts on themselves, or is it just because of, uh, of their nature? Okay. So when we see that different people have a different, this is this is spirituality differently. They have different kinds of faith, even in the spiritual path. Why is that? See, because faith is also an evolving asset for us. Uh, the faith that we have is built over lifetimes. Shraddha mayoyam purusha purusha yoya shraddha sa eva saha. In 17.3, the Bhagavad Krishna says that we are made of our faith. And as our faith is, so we become. So it's uh, the faith that we have is shaped by what we have done in the past lives, what, what kind of upbringing we had, and uh, what kind of life experiences we have had. So in general, if we do three things, first is follow the process of bhakti itself regularly. Second is associate with devotees who have faith and who help us increase our faith. And ourselves contemplate the process, contemplate the truths of life. So basically there's like a the practices connect us with the divine. The association gives us a social context for exercising our faith. And the study of scriptural texts gives us an intellectual impetus to our faith. So that this way we can all by by spiritual contact, by intellectual contemplation, by social connections, we all can move forward from whatever faith we have right now. Okay. Yes. You mentioned the last point R is release. Um, it's easier to say we can release, but I think the hard part is knowing when to release. I think our mind is doesn't allow us to release. They think it keeps telling us that. No, you can do it. You always can do it or keep doing it. So mm, that's true. Internal dialogue. Yeah. So when? How do we decide when to release? <clears throat> yes, that's why we need a overall sense of purpose for our life. Overall sense of purpose means that okay, this is extremely important for me, but this is not everything in my life. See, when we make one thing into everything, we will never want to release it. Because we have reduced our whole life conception to that one thing. But, if this is important, but my life is bigger. Say, so if, if somebody is, I met as recently a student, in India there is, they have this exam called IIT. It's for getting into the top colleges, Indian Institute of Technology. So, for some students, IIT becomes the Institute of Infinite Torture. (laughs) 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 They just struggle, struggle. There's this boy, he has been trying for 10 years to get into IIT. Now his equals have graduated and already working. And somehow, well, okay, if you don't get into IIT, it's not the end of the world. So, okay, you don't get into IIT, just move on. You try once, twice. If it doesn't work, just move on in life. So basically, if we reduce our whole life to one thing alone, if that that student really has reduced their life to the goal that I want the I want the IIT badge on my name, then it just become crazy. So basically, we can say that we all have various roles in our life. Say uh, <clears throat> we are a professional. Say we are a citizen of a particular country. 
we are a member of a family we are the brother of someone we are the spouse of someone we are the parents of someone we are the children of someone like that we have various roles in our lives and we can consider that all these roles are like channels for the flow of a river our consciousness is flowing through these various channels and ultimately through our all our roles we are meant to go towards the whole now we work in our career because god has given us some talents and we want to use those talents constructively in a mood of service and contribution what we are is god's gift to us what we become is our gift to god so so, so we see similarly if we are parents our children are not just our children they are god's children who have been entrusted to our care so through all our roles we see them as channels by which our consciousness can flow towards the divine now we are not our roles we are a soul who is a part of god so we become excessively attached to something when we identify with the role so if if somebody identifies themselves as a software engineer and somehow they lose the job then they will get the question who am i it's not a philosophical question but <laughs> it is a existential question for them who, what is my identity if somebody identifies themselves primarily as a parent and if they find their child is say going on a wrong track then they will feel my whole life is a failure we cannot identify with any role so much that it becomes our defining identity so all these are roles and they are very important but they are roles so it's like if the water doesn't flow from one channel we don't have to reduce the whole river's flow to that one channel somehow make it flow we try to get the water to flow through the channel but we also make sure the water keeps flowing through other channels and then eventually sometime the the water has a blockage on this particular channel that blockage will end and water will flow from there also so if trying to get one thing done in our life brings other things in us to a stand still in our life not just temporarily but for a long time now any important thing in our life will take priority and other things will have to go into the background but that is a it is a emergency so if one thing in our one role in our life brings all other other roles to a stand still then that is a disproportionate attachment every role is important and you need to be responsible but we are not responsible for the role alone we are responsible for the whole who for the connection with the whole and for ourselves as souls who we are so that's the broad parameter that if one thing starts bringing our entire remaining life to a stand still then no i won't let my remaining life stop i will with some finite effort i'll try to keep moving this if it's very important for me but i'll make sure the other aspects of my life also keep moving is that answer your question okay yes the selling lie is like telling lie is justified for a good cause can i tell a lie as answer <laughs> 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 the Mah- the mahabharat explains that right and wrong actions can be decided broadly by three factors which is the intent the content and the consequence the content broadly refers to category category so normally we think of morality as categorical that this is this is the category of right and this is the category of wrong and categorical morality is important no doubt but morality is not just categorical it is also contextual say if there is a there's a riot going on and say our friend is being persecuted by some mad people is is a is being if that friend comes running to our house and please save me and we give them refuge in our house we hide, hide them somewhere in a closet and those rioters come and bang on our door is he there now should we speak the truth no isn't it if we speak the truth that person will die and speaking lie is bad but a die death of someone is far worse so if somebody operates only based on categorical morality 
then sometimes they may may take wrong decisions although they thinking they are taking the right decision so morality is also also contextual contextual means we have to look at what is the consequence of the action and similarly we have to look at the intent say if a child doesn't want to take medicines and the mother says that you know mother wants the child to take the medicine so that mother puts the medicine in some some sweet or something like that some chocolate covers it says is this medicine no this is just chocolate take it the intent is good so this is not meant to license so the categorical division is not unimportant it should not be trivialized and we shouldn't think that just for my purposes i can speak lies any time that's not the point the point is that we can't make speaking truth the supreme virtue make speaking truth the supreme virtue it is a virtue but truth also has to be seen in terms of the context so on some occasions exceptionally uh, it may be justified <clears throat> to withhold some aspect of the truth but that is based on so we have to look at intent we have to look at consequence and then we can decide but generally it is it is always virtuous to speak the truth it is always desirable but on some occasions uh, speaking truth can lead to a greater harm than speaking on truth Does answer your question yeah. okay. okay good yeah sure yes please you mentioned about the acronym fear yes focus engagement pride really and i'm just saying um there's a conflicting thing that i've heard is <clears throat> you focus you engage accountability and resilience okay. i'm trying to correlate this you know, like he proves said that you know you release it but you should know when to release it what about resilience where does that fit into the is it because of if you don't have spiritual association you don't get the power or the bonus you know the benefit of creating resilience because resilience is something that can withstand Okay, good question. So does uh, so here can also be said that focus, engagement, accountability, and mm -hmm. resilience. Yes, so does resilience correlate with spirituality? And release, and, re and release also. And yes, it's completely and yes, it's a good question. I'd say three broad points here. first is that all of us by our past have got a particular kind of body and mind just like some people may be having much stronger physical muscles than others so they can lift huge weights and some people if they lift huge weights after some time i just want to sit down now but some people they lift huge weights and okay what what next to do so they have greater physical strength so similarly some of us may have you could say greater emotional strength or greater psychological strength and some of us may have lesser just as lesser physical strength mm -hmm. is not a character flaw mm -hmm. similarly lesser psychological strength is also not a not a character flaw it is just the kind of mind that we have just as we all have different bodies we also have different minds so if some people are less resilient than others that should not be seen as a character flaw it's just that that's the kind of mind that they have having said that just like the second point would be that just as muscles can be strengthened by proper exercise similarly our inner muscles our psychological strength can also be increased so some people may already be psychologically very tough in the then that means they may have resilience even if they are not spiritual because that's the way they have been brought up that's the kind of karma they have done in the past so they may have that so it's not that resilience will come only by spirituality resilience might just be there among people who may not have any spirituality also but resilience can be increased by spirituality because what our spirituality does is that it helps us connect with something bigger basically when what, what do we mean by resilience that say something something terrible happens in our life and we are knocked down 
but then do we get up so we are knocked down again we get up so one way we can get that resilience to get up is by seeing failure as just a part of life not so failure is like a comma is like a it's like a comma it's not a full stop so within a materialistic conception some failures can seem like just a full stop if somebody's dream is to become an athlete and they get into some accident where they become immobilized then that dream is over forever you may see my life has ended now so but if we have spirituality we understand that we are bigger that we are souls and we have a bigger purpose in life so basically materialism makes us think that life is like a 100 meter sprint you just have to get to the destination as fast as possible but spirituality helps us understand that life is like a 100 mile marathon and even if i fall back in one lap it's not the end of the world in a sprint it's the end of the world but in a marathon okay when i fall back i can rise and i can resume and i can catch up also so that seeing that bigger picture that expanded perception that itself can give that can increase our resilience because we don't see uh, failure as fatal because that because we don't we are indestructible and our life is much bigger than any particular incident in our life so that seeing the bigger picture can increase our resilience that's one way the third point would be that also the connection with the divine connection with god that comes through spirituality that can also help us to get a inner shield a inner armor you know how does that happen basically we all are constantly thinking of something or the other and of course mm-hmm. we need to have functional thoughts okay i have to drive a car over here i have to get this job done but if we consider our thoughts they have our thoughts are so many far beyond our functional thoughts so we are all looking for a satisfying object of thought a satisfying strengthening sublimating object of thought now many some people do that by just going into entertainment so watch some movies watch some sports some people try to take hallucinogenic hallucinogenic drugs and go into an alternate reality so what the one of the biggest needs that we all have is a satisfying object of thought and most of the things that we think about they are important for us but they are not always satisfying but when we connect with with the divine uh, through with a mood of devotion basically by the practice of bhakti yoga we not only develop a connection with the divine but we also experience satisfaction contemplating on, on god so when we are disturbed often life determines our problems but we determine their size life determines our problems but we determine their size how is that when we have a problem the more we keep thinking about the problem if we consider the correlation of problem solving capacity with time if you don't think about a problem that's also a big problem but think about it i don't know, okay okay i've got this disease i got this i have to, how do i deal with it so the more we think about it it will say our problem capac if we consider time versus problem solving capacity the graph moves upward the more we think the greater amount of clarity we may get but this is not a infinitely rising line beyond a particular point mm-hmm. of time it flattens out we keep thinking we keep thinking and still there is we don't get any further clarity and after some time the graph starts falling down the more we think about it the more confused we get some people are like you know i was confused earlier now i am not so sure <laughs> so <clears throat> we need to think about whatever issues we are dealing with but we need to stop thinking about it also but how do we stop thinking about it unless we have something satisfying to think about so problems sometimes seem to come with an inbuilt glue so that the our just mind is catch caught in the problem but if we have developed a habit of devotion of directing our thoughts towards 
the divine then that gives us satisfaction then we can do that amidst problems also and then that will give us satisfaction that will give us strength that will give us solace and the life's bl life's blows will hit us but after life's blows have hit have hit us we won't keep hitting ourselves further by overthinking about the problem okay this happened it's over now let me direct my thoughts somewhere else and so the wound that was caused the wound cannot be stopped the wound cannot be wished away but we want to worsen the wound by our beating ourselves up overthinking about it but rather by directing our thoughts towards the divine we will heal from that wound faster so in that sense spirituality can increase our resilience further so let go means okay this thing happened in my life it is a bad thing so sometimes bad things happen but sometimes good may emerge from the bad also so let me accept it and let me move on in life so definitely spirituality can increase our resilience and releasing is basically when we are thinking about a problem and trying to solve it so once we realize that okay now my thinking is not bringing any more clarity then release i did my part things didn't work out it's over now so releasing can help us in the journey towards resilience thank you very much hari krishna hari krishna thanks to his grace chaitanya charan prabhu for such an